Greetings to everyone here. My name is Rita Ferrone, and I will be the moderator for our conversation on this webinar today. Some of you have written into the text box to say hello, and we are so excited that all of you are here. Some of you may have come across my work or you know me from other places. I'm a liturgist, a writer. I, I wrote an essay for the book we're gonna be discussing today, the essay on liturgy and social justice. And uh, I am the author of several books about liturgy. Most recently, Pastoral Guide to Pope Francis's Desiderio Desideravi, published by Liturgical Press. But the real news today is you. I am so excited to share that more than 950 people have registered for this webinar about the wonderful liturgy and life study Bible. And not all of them will be in the room today. Uh, some are registered so that they can watch the webinar at a later date. But it's really wonderful to see so much interest and we'll have a great time. You've come from all over. Uh, we saw that even in the chat, but there's uh, we know many more uh, places are represented from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south you've gathered for this. We have participants actually from all over the world and all parts of the United States. Welcome all. Before we introduce our special guests, uh, the editors who wrote and assembled this study Bible, we're first going to hear from our esteemed colleague from Liturgical Press, Editorial Director Hans Christofferson, and he is going to give us a few housekeeping announcements. Hans? Thank you, Rita. Yeah, welcome, everybody. Uh, I was just going to mention that we do have a few housekeeping notes to share with you. Uh, the first one is that you are all in listen-only mode, so your cameras and your microphones uh, are turned off. And we are recording today's event, and we will email a link to the final recording to all registered attendees in the coming days. If you have questions, Please post them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom screen at any time. We plan to leave time at the end to answer most of those questions, or at least a good deal of them. And lastly, we are giving away one free copy of the Liturgy and Life Study Bible to one lucky winner registrant. Additionally, we are offering all registrants a limited time discounted price on the Liturgy and Life Study Bible. Check your email in the coming days to take advantage of these offers. With that, we'll turn it over to Rita and to Paul Turner and to John Martins. Thank you. So I, I would like to thank you, Hans. I would like to turn now to our featured guests, Professor John W. Martins and Father Paul Turner, and ask them to share with us a bit of their background and maybe tell us a little bit about your rel um, respective roles in creating this volume. Um, John, maybe you would start us off. Sure, I'm happy to. Thank you so much, Rita, for agreeing to moderate this, and thank you to Liturgical Press. And of course, a huge thanks to Paul Turner, and we have worked together on this for a um, little over five years, I think. And so our roles from the beginning were to sort of shape what this would look like, because a study Bible has to have a certain shape a certain form and one of the first things we did we gathered in collegeville uh with the editors and that is the editors from liturgical press to decide what kind of essays would we have what kinds of topics would we cover and so th this was really an exciting time where we decided on how we were going to do that what we were going to who we're going to invite which was also very exciting and um how we're going to portion that out we also then wrote the introductions for each of these biblical books. Paul took on the Old Testament. Um, I took on the New Testament. And so we wrote individual introductions for each of them. Then we wrote notes that appear within the Bible. We'll talk about that a bit more. Um, it's a, it was a really wonderful task for me. It came after I'd been the scripture scholar for America magazine for a while and moving sort of away from just doing academic study of the Bible to really reaching out to people in the pews, people who read the Bible on a daily basis, not for academic purposes as such, but to be sustained by it, to grow through it. 
And so that was in my mind as I was doing the work as well. Um, and Paul had particular roles to play that I'll let him him describe because there's something pretty remarkable that he added to this Bible, I think. Um, Thanks, John, tell us what tell us what your day job is, uh, just so we know that you aren't always <laughs> doing the study Bible. I know you have another life also. Yeah, I, I do. Um, so I am currently the director of the Center for Christian Engagement at St. Mark's College. That's a small Catholic college at a very large university in Canada, the University of British Columbia, which has about 60,000 students. And we are a small theological college, and I teach theology there. I'm a professor of theology, and I direct the center, which is intending to re-engage people who have sort of maybe drifted away from the church, have left the church, just to get them involved again in conversations uh, about the faith and and yeah I, I mean it, it's not proselytizing but it's it's an invitation great thank you thanks so much paul i'm paul turner i'm a priest of the diocese of kansas city saint joseph in northwest missouri where i serve as pastor of our cathedral of the immaculate conception i'm also director of our diocesan office of of divine worship then uh Lit Press has been very kind to publish many of my books. I'm very grateful to them and um, do some lecturing and writing of articles. I'm also uh, a consultant for the Dicastery for Divine Worship and the Discipline of the Sacraments in Rome, and uh, which is mainly a stay-at-home job. It just increases email a couple of times a year. And, uh, and then I do some work for the International Commission on English and the Liturgy. And it's that work that has led to the contribution to the Bible that John has alluded to. Um, over the years, my, my work with ISIL has brought me into uh, contact with some of the biblical passages that lie behind many of the prayers that we use at Mass. Beyond the lectionary, I, I think people have been largely unaware that within the Roman Missal, within all of the other liturgical books, there are multiple allusions to biblical passages. So ISIL had been collecting these book by book, but I started to tabulate them in a, in a chart so that we, I could have easy reference to them and was looking for a product to share them with and behold, the, uh, the Liturgy and Life Study Bible came into being. So you'll find that apparatus at the bottom of every page showing you which liturgical books connect to which biblical passages. I don't know anybody else who's done this in any language, so it's uh, unique to English and unique to, to Lit Press. And, and it gives full scope for your obsessive compulsive textual <laughs> <laughs> att attention. So, so it's, it's been wonderful to see the fruit of, of something so, uh, so personal as well as so universal. Uh, here. Thanks, Thanks for that. Paul. Yep. And, and thank you both. This is uh, interesting to see how your different gifts really uh, have complemented each other. And um, do you want to say anything else about how you apportion the work? I mean, it, no, New Testament and Old Testament. There's a lot more Old Testament than New Testament. Do you have anything, uh, comments about that, Paul? Yeah, I learned that after I agreed to do the Old Testament <laughs> introductions. <laughs> no, uh, John is... Uh... John's area of expertise is in New Testament, and I, I, I'm equally inexpert at both of them. So it, uh, <laughs> it seemed just as much uh, for for me to take on the the Old Testament intros, but it was an interesting exercise to do to read that book of the Bible, reflect on it from the perspective of liturgy. How does how does worship appear in this book of the Bible, and and how do we use this book in in our worship? Those were, I'd say, the two main questions that directed the the whole compilation of this study Bible. Thank you both for taking us behind the scenes a bit to, you know, how this thing began and how it was a collaborative venture and how you've really been living with it and living into it from your own unique perspectives over these years. And, and now we, we do see the wonderful fruit of that. So let's begin. Uh, I'd like to dive right in with some practical questions. Um, this is a book written to be used. Obviously, this is a book written to be used. So let's look first at what's in it. And then I'd like to have you guide us to see how it can be a useful tool 
in a couple of different venues or, or different situations. Um, now, in the audience, those of you who have the book already, you might want to have it handy just so that you can open it up and see what they're talking about when they, we are uh, looking at different parts of it. But if you don't have the book yet, you haven't yet got your copy, uh, don't worry. We will explain everything. It'll all be on the screen. So not to worry if you don't have it, but if you do have it, you might want to pull it out. Uh, you won't miss anything if, if uh, you don't have it today. Now, you know, I just held this up and actually I felt like I ought to be doing more exercises so that I could lift it up. <laughs> so, well, I need to get to the gym more often. It's a big, it's a big book. There's a lot in here. John, can you give us a quick overview just of, you know, what all is in there? Yeah. Uh, well, it's a great question. Um, and as Paul said, you know, worship really guided us, both worship within the Bible and how the Bible is used in worship. So I'm going to share my screen if, so that people uh, who don't have access to the Bible now can at least get a look at it. Uh, so if that takes just a moment, uh, folks will bear with me. Hopefully you're able to see that. So I've chosen, obviously, just one book to look at here, and I think uh, Paul will look at another. But one of the things that you get in every study Bible are introductions to each book. And Paul just alluded to the fact that he took on <laughs> the greater part of writing the Old Testament intros. And I wrote uh, the New Testament intros. And so when you look at the study Bible, there's actually going to be two introductions. We're using the New American Bible Revised Edition, and they have approved introductions that also appear in this Bible. These pink introductions are the ones that Paul and I wrote. And so what we do here is we do give a background on the actual book, just sort of general questions. Where did this gospel emerge from? Where did Matthew come from? What's the background of it? And then if you see, as I'm moving down here, each of these introductions has, well, it, it depends on each book, right? As to how long they are. What is worship and liturgy in the gospel according to Matthew? And this again takes on these two roles. Where does worship and liturgy appear in the gospel? And how is it actually used in the documents of the Roman Catholic Church and other churches as well? So one of the things I focus on here, for instance, is the fact that the language of worship actually does appear in the Gospel of Matthew much more often than any other book of the New Testament, Jesus being worshipped. And so this is one of the fascinating things, of course, in the development of Christianity, is that the Jews who were first followers of Jesus actually begin to worship him at some point. How did that take place? How did that begin? And so we look at each of these books accordingly. And I'll go back and talk a little bit more about that in terms of the essays. But apart from looking at these elements, I'm going to scroll down and take us to an actual page of the biblical text. So I'm going to move through the introduction. And now we come to the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. And one of the things you'll notice is that we have notes within the text. And each of these notes basically, again, focus on if not formal liturgy, how do the early Christians, the followers of Jesus, how do they worship? So we have a note here for 423.25 in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus' authority and power to heal the sick and the possessed are passed on to the church in the sacrament of the anointing of the sick and the rite of exorcism. So we have these throughout the text, uh, that is each of the biblical books. Now you'll also notice notes here, and these notes, again, belong to the New American Bible Revised Edition. These are part of that uh, translation. But what you'll find here, and I will leave this for Paul to speak about in more detail, is precisely what he was talking about, this chart that charts where each passage in the Bible actually appears in a document, a liturgical document, or the Mass of the Roman uh, Catholic Church. So, for instance, I just mentioned that passage 4, 23 to 25, appears in Book of Blessings, order for the blessing of a new hospital or other facility for the care of the sick. It doesn't appear in a lot of documents, but it does appear. And you can see the connection there, obviously, to the worship of the church 
and the practice of the church. I want to um, just, do I have to change? I don't think I do to show you a different, or maybe I have to stop sharing and then share again. Is that correct? If I want to show a different document? Let me see here. No, there we go. So apart from what's going on on each page, we also have at the beginning of the Bible, we have essays. And so I'm just showing this one that I wrote. There's a number of others. I'm going to show a different one later if we have time as well. But this is on early Christian worship. So you might be wondering, well, what sort of thing is going on in terms of early Christian worship? How do they gather? Since we don't think they have church buildings for the first 300 years, let's say, or at least the first 200, where are they worshiping? And you'll see here this word, the same word that I was mentioning in the introduction to Matthew, proscuneo, to worship. And so this essay and all of the essays expand upon various elements that you'll find within the study Bible and give you more background, more detail. And we drew on experts from the Protestant tradition, from the Jewish tradition to describe Jewish liturgy, as well, of course, as a lot of Catholics. So that's right. a basic introduction to the content. So, um, we, you know, just looking over the table of contents, there's a series of essays. There's a material on each of the books of the Bible and this kind of dense uh, apparatus that uh, assists you in looking uh, uh, line by line through the biblical text. Have we left anything else out? Is there, no, there's a chart at the back as well. What, what, what are we missing? Is that right, Paul, the, the chart at the back, right? Is there a chart? I'd have to look it up. Oh, no, maybe maybe I'm getting it this confused with something else. Mm -hmm, I, yeah. I, I, no, I think, I think all the, uh, I, I, it's my, yeah, there, there is uh, a, uh, a, a correlation of the Sunday readings with the Holy Scriptures. That, that's it. That's so it. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's also something of a tool for matching the lectionary to the text. Is, that's right. Is that right? Okay. Well, it, you know, as you, as you talk about it, John, it seems like there's really a lot of material in here that could enrich homilies uh, preaching the word and also could be resources for a catechist who was going to break open the word um, at, at the liturgy of the word as it celebrated not only the scripture text, but importantly, the, the lectionary readings, and then also the liturgy of the word prayers and uh, other uh, uh, liturgical texts. Um, so I'm wondering now, you know, just what would be a way to, that someone could use this book to uh, prepare to preach the word in a homily or to break open the word in a catechetical session? And I'm thinking maybe Paul could walk us through some of that. Paul, can you can you give us an example? I'd be happy to do that. So let's take a look at the readings we are going to hear this coming weekend at uh, at Mass. Um, I'm hoping that you can see the uh, see the page. And now that I'm opening up this page, I see it does it is not exactly the page I thought it was, but it's all right. Um, we we can see up to here the end of the the passage. The gospel passage this weekend is Mark chapter one, fourteen to twenty. So the beginning of the uh, of the Gospel of Mark, and you see how it ends here. But then at the, at the bottom is an extremely lengthy list of connections between the different liturgical books and the uh, and the passage that's that's under under development. So we, I think I've counted over twenty thousand connections between the the Bible and and the liturgical books. So if you just want to take a, a, a look at the first column, which I know is extremely dense, but you'll find with uh, with with Jesus's command to uh, to uh, follow him, to 
to to be become become a disciple. We have all of these references to baptism time and again through here, prayers for the baptism of of children, and so on. Now this is just the the gospel passage. So let me jump over to the first reading, which this weekend comes from Jonah. And you'll see Jonah chapter three verses one to five and ten are the uh, particular ones. So again, oh, I'm I've pulled up Mark again, haven't I? Excuse me. I, I was seeing Jonah. You had Were Jonah. you? Oh, okay, that was my mistake. Let me come back here. Is Jonah there? Okay, I've yes. got it now. Jonah. Sorry, thanks. Yeah, thanks I see for Jonah. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, so here we've got Jonah one to five, and then it skips several verses here and goes on to verse. 10 on uh, on the following page but the primary section here where jesus is uh, commanding people to repent and believe jonah is giving a very simple message here 40 days more and nineveh will be destroyed and as a result uh, they proclaim a fast and put on sackcloth and immediately respond to the message of jonah so you can see immediately why the editors of the of the lectionary chose to pair up these two passages. Here at the bottom, you find in the in the chart apparatus exactly what we were looking at, the the third Sunday in ordinary time for year B. That will be this this coming Sunday. And then the full passage, including those verses that this skips over, appears in several other places. In the Liturgy of the Hours, on the first, third, and fifth Sundays of Lent, you'll find a reference to the ministry of Jonah. So even there, his own message is being alluded to in the intercessions in the Liturgy of the Hours. In the lectionary, this, this passage appears in the first week of Lent on Wednesday, the 27th week in Ordinary Time on another weekday, Masses for various needs and occasions for the remission of sins, it'll reappear there as, as another option. So I, I think when you're meditating on uh, a scripture passage to preach about, you can look at this and see, well, how does the Catholic Church use a passage like this? What is, what is it saying? And it's not just that it comes in sequence as it would on certain days like the, the weekdays in ordinary time, but that during Lent and at a special Mass for the remission of sins, this message is going to be especially powerful. So it tells you something about how the church is using that, that passage. I'm going to skip over the psalm for, uh, for, for now, just, just in the interest of time, and show you this, uh, this passage from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, which will also be our second reading this weekend. Many of you know that in, as Ordinary Time begins each January, the second reading is always from 1 Corinthians. That, that book is so long and so important that we divide it into thirds and read the essential passages of the entire book. So we're in year B, so we, we drop anchor in the middle third. That's why last week we heard some verses from chapter 6. And this week, we'll be hearing some verses from chapter 7. And it's here where Paul is saying, you know, that, that the time is, is uh, excuse me, the time is running out. Those who uh, have wives should live as not having them. Those weeping as not weeping. Paul's, Paul's trying to say, we should be thinking about more important things than materiality. We should be thinking about the, the eternal life to come. And this, this passage is fairly brief for this coming weekend. It ends with verse 31 and a rather famous passage for the world in its present form is passing away. So now when you look at the apparatus at the bottom of the pages, you see a number of different places where this passage is used. Some of the verses, especially in the ones preceding the one that we have now, are dealing with those who are unmarried, and that's why you'll find religious life and saints who have lived in a celibate state are being lifted up here as connectors to this particular passage. You'll also see here that the uh, 
the last the last verse of this Sunday's second reading has an allusion in the 17th Sunday in Ordinary Times collect. Let me just read that collect for you while you look at the passage here. Again, this is the passage we're looking at, just that one verse, and you'll see, you'll hear the, the connection. It's not a direct quote, but it certainly is an allusion to it. Well, God, protector of those who hope in you, without whom nothing has firm foundation, nothing is holy, bestow in abundance your mercy upon us, and grant that with you as our ruler and guide, we may use the good things that pass in such a way as to hold fast even now to those that endure. So you can you can catch how relying on this passage from Paul, the, the missile has turned this into a prayer that people can use on a different Sunday of the year. But if you're if you're preaching this passage or even preaching on the 17th Sunday in ordinary time and you want to say something about the collect of that day. You can you can refer back to the, the inspiration of other places in the Bible that have brought us to this point. So the, the whole point is to open up the view of how this passage gets used beyond this particular Sunday's reading and see how the, the church finds great depth in these passages throughout its various usages. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, John, I want to turn to you now as a scripture scholar. You're the veteran of many <laughs> different kinds of Bible studies that take place on different levels, both academic and pastoral. Uh, for our purposes today, let's zoom in on the parish level for a minute, since that's where most of our people are. Uh, suppose you were advising someone on how to prepare a Bible study based on a particular theme or a book of the Bible for a parish group, how would you recommend that they use this book? Yeah, they, it, a really good question. And I, I think that in terms of Bible study, of course, one of the things that I like to keep in mind and, and did keep in mind with this, with working on this Bible is that, of course, we wanted to have uh, the best academic resources available for people. And we wanted to have top-notch, up-to-date um, academic material available. And I think we did that. But I also want to keep in mind that worship is where people mostly meet scripture, uh, in the pews, listening to it, and then with their friends and their fellow parishioners studying it. And so I think, as with every study Bible, there are numbers of resources that are available within the text itself that helps. So, you know, every study Bible is going to have, you know, good introductions. We think our introductions are unique in that they do focus on worship and liturgy. And so I think when you're studying the Bible together with a group, you can really utilize all of those resources, the introductions to each book. But you can also utilize the notes and the notes within the text itself. And if those draw you more deeply, you can then, I think, go look at our essay. So let, let me give an example. Um, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to share a different um, essay. And this is by Christine Henriksen Garraway. Uh, Christine Garraway is a professor at Hebrew Union College at University of Southern California. And she's a Jewish scholar. And so we wanted to draw in Jewish scholars as well to describe their own tradition to the extent that we could. And so let's say you're studying the Gospel of John and you're wondering, what is this festival of dedication that Jesus is going to participate in? What, what did it mean to participate in festivals in ancient Israel? And what we get here is that kind of introduction that gets you to the best information that will help you understand your own study um, of this particular book. So even from the beginning, I just love this beginning of this essay. I don't know if people can see it there where I've blocked it off or if it gets in the way there. Uh, the term Israelite festival calendar is somewhat of a misnomer as it implies that there is one fixed calendar. So right from the beginning, she's saying, look, it's more complex than you might think. Things change, things developed. But if you're interested in learning about any particular um, festival, you know, you're going to get an indication of where that takes place, what's going on with any of them. But I, I just think about 
you know, at the very end, the most important post-biblical Jewish holiday to be added was Hanukkah, which commemorates the cleansing and rededication of the Second Temple. Well, this is something that it does appear in the New Testament, in the Gospel of John, where Jesus goes to this festival. And in fact, you only find this in the Maccabean literature, which of course doesn't form a part of the the Hebrew Bible as such, but as part of the Septuagint, and of course, as part of the Catholic Bible. So we're giving this kind of deep ability, I think, and access um, to top scholarship that can really allow you to dig into uh, the Bible and what it says for us today. So it's not just historical information, it's not just data, but it allows you to understand the Bible more fully to have an encounter with what's going on in scripture. But we think, you know, you need both that, that academic material, but you also need, and this is forefront in our Bible, a focus on what the Bible and why it, you know, initially emerged both in the Jewish and in the Christian setting. And that was for worship, to encounter the living God. And I think that that's something that will really help people in their study of the Bible and parishes. You know, in both of these examples, the one that Paul gave and the one that John gave, it seems to me that, you know, the creativity of the preacher or the catechist is still so important to take this off of the page and to make it relevant to the people that you're serving. Uh, but the key thing here that I'm hearing from both of your examples is that you'll be doing this based on solid scholarship. You'll be doing it based on stuff that has been carefully honed and curated so that you can use this as a tool to uh, expand your knowledge, uh, base your creativity on something that's really there and, and not just uh, imagination, uh, which is untethered from the, the texts. And, uh, and then uh, to have it also as a a place to go for inspiration because uh, some of the things you you mentioned, both of you, you know, um, I wouldn't necessarily have picked up what Paul was saying about you know the uh, consecrated life as uh, you know a, a kind of spinoff of this uh, uh, reading of uh, next Sunday's uh, epistle reading or um, the the Hebrew festivals and how they appear in the gospel of John. There's a lot of that that I think, you know, often we skate over because we just don't know a whole lot about it. And uh, having some, some good information uh, can make the difference between losing those pieces or, or maybe threading your uh, creative ideas through those uh, pearls of, of fact and wisdom that come to us from the, the text and its context in our, our liturgical tradition. Okay, well, thank you both uh, so much. I'd like to uh, shift gears a bit now. Uh, oh, but, you know, maybe if there's anything finally you want to say, I, I'm going on too long. Uh, maybe you have a, another thing you'd like to add about what's in the book uh, before I go on to my next question. So I, I think we've we've covered uh, the highlights of, of the content and the applications of it. Uh, just to underscore, if somebody's using some other tool for a Bible study on the Gospel of Matthew, for example, I think whoever the catechist is guiding that would find additional background here that would help them really do an outstanding job in guiding people through it. You're exactly right, Rita, that they're just kind of do-it-yourself aspect to this where you're you're taking some elements from here learning from them and and bring them in and then of course people can use this for their own private reflection as yes. well many people meditate on the daily scripture readings from mass as part of their daily prayer if you were to look those up in the study bible you would just find the 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 context come to life and so people can benefit individually from that as well Anything else, John, to, to say? No, I, I would just add to that. I think that's really true is that every resource that's offered, and there are many good ones out there, we think we're offering something that is not found anywhere else. But of course, what we're really hoping for is people to enter more deeply into a relationship with scripture, more deeply into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And every 
every tool, every resource that does that, that's what's really driving what we're doing, right? Is that people are able to be guided in their own deepening of their relationships with Christ and with the church. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this leads perfectly into my next question, which is I'd like to shift gears to the big picture. Mm -hmm. uh, the liturgy is full of scripture. Your book demonstrates this. Uh, the scriptures are full of liturgy, uh, which is something not everybody uh, homes in on, but it's there. Uh, liturgical prayer, ritual connections are abundant. The worship of God is not something that started with the Roman Missal. It's existed as long as there have been faithful people. Okay, so you've put together a book that teases out these connections between liturgy and scripture and life, you know, life in the periods in which these books were written and our life, you know, our, our life now as readers, receivers of the word, right? Uh, and so we're in an ongoing conversation with one another, with the scripture and with the liturgy uh, in our life of faith. So I'd like to uh, delve more into what John was just touching on a minute ago, the so what question. What's the end game? You've made us aware of this ongoing conversation and you've invited us to immerse ourselves in it. What are you hoping that this will accomplish over the long run? Well, I think primarily, I, I'd love people to know the Bible better. I'd love to know the Bible better. And I, I found working on this project certainly certainly helped me. The, the Bible is in a class by itself. So when I make my next comment, I'd like to understand the liturgy better. I understand that that is a secondary uh, outcome, but that is the, the the goal of this particular book is to achieve these these two things. Uh, I I think there's more depth to the Catholic liturgy than anyone imagines. Even even uh, people who've studied the liturgy for years keep uncovering layer after layer of of meaning, allusions to things, how the Bible has influenced our worship over all these years. So my hope is that people will continue to go deeper into the liturgy through their, their encounter with this book and come to a, a greater expression of faith, but it'll be resting on the Bible, the, the foundation of, of what we believe. Thank you. John? Yeah, I, I, as you know, Rita, uh, we had talked about it um, prior to to this um, meeting together, the the webinar. I grew up in the Mennonite Church. I wasn't raised in the Catholic Church, and Scripture was a huge part of. Even it could be as a child, I didn't always love it. My dad would read devotionals, right? He'd read scripture and would discuss them at the at the breakfast table. And I'm thinking, you know, I'd like to <laughs> not do this, but it, it really does seep into it. And, it, and I'm, I'm very thankful for that now. Um, but what was really interesting to me uh, as I began to study scripture and as I went to graduate school and continued to study it, and I, I did that at a Catholic institution and had Catholic professors. It was sort of interesting how that came about. But the more I learned about liturgy, the more I saw scripture coming alive there. And I realized that, you know, you really had the worship of the early Christians even prior to the New Testament, and that the New Testament itself emerges from the worship of the early Christians. Mm -hmm. And so even prior to the Gospels, we have the worship of Jesus. And so for me, you know, I, I didn't grow up with a really profound liturgy, and I'm not being critical of the Mennonite liturgy that I grew up with and that I, I continue to love, but I was really drawn to the Catholic liturgy. I, I really felt that that more formal worship was really helpful for me in understanding scripture. And so I, I really want people to see scripture as being the heart of the church's worship as well, and that we share it together in community when we're in church together. Well, John, Paul, thank you very much. You've given us a lot to think about, as well as some very practical assistance in opening the book and imagining uses for what's inside uh, that you have collected and presented so so very in such great detail. Uh, now I address myself to our Zoom companions. Uh, we'd like to open the floor to your questions to our speakers. Uh, some questions have already come in in the chat, 
So we'll start with those. And as Hans said at the beginning, uh, uh, we may have not uh, got time for every question, but we're going to try to, to do as many as we can. We just ask your understanding because we have uh, limited uh, limited time. Okay, so I I see we have a couple of uh, of questions here. Does the panel have a view on choosing a version of the Bible as in, an inspiration for English language liturgical composition? Some translations seem noticeably more prosaic, good for clarity and study, but less good for poetry. Very, very keen observation there. This seems to be a real question for all the churches as they strive for creativity and dignity in the liturgy. Yeah, let me let me jump into that because uh, this is a topic that comes up from time to time at ISIL meetings. You you may be aware that in the United States, the translation we use for the Mass is the New American Bible, but that's not true of every country that speaks English around the world. There are several different translations, and depending on which conference of bishops you're in, they may have selected a different English translation that they think works best for, for the people there. So I would just be aware that even worldwide, there's no global agreement on one English language Bible that is going to be the perfect one. Uh, for my, my pastoral advice is to dive into the New American Bible, because if you live in the United States anyway, or the Philippines, I think they use it as well, that these, these would be places uh, where you can get the greatest benefit from meditating again and again on the words that you will hear again and again in, in a certain translation. John, you may have some other views on that. No, I mean, I think you're you're really the expert on this in, in, in every respect, but you are correct that in Canada, the new revised standard version is used. Uh, and this is very much um, one of the... Um, you know, most utilized versions by biblical scholars. Uh, so it's an excellent translation, just I think as the NAB is as well. Um, but the, the question of, of the poetry of it is is really intriguing um, because, you know, the, the for instance, King James, Dewey Rhymes, et cetera, have all been superseded, um, but there's a great beauty in the language. Um, and I, I studied with Northrop Fry many years ago, um, mm -hmm. who, who wrote the great code uh, on the Bible. And, and he loved the King James, not because he thought it was the best translation, but he loved the poetry of it. And, and the, the, the thing about a translation like that is people could memorize it, right? Because everyone was utilizing the same one. And we have so many different Bible translations now. But I will say that most of them are quite good. And I think the NAB, our revised edition is quite good. The NRSV is quite good. There are limitations perhaps to all of them, which is why I do think study Bibles are so significant. But in terms of reading and hearing in the liturgy, I think, you know, an, an openness to that will, will let scripture speak. I think that that ability to hear, um, because it speaks to each of us differently too. Uh, and depending on where we're at in our lives, sometimes we don't want to hear what it says, but <laughs> it speaks, it opens us up. Yeah, I would add a little uh, a footnote to that too. You know, the New American had to be revised be to be in conjunction with Liturgium Authenticum. Some of the passages I find clunky. You know, I, I, I so much... Um, I can remember verbatim translations of Hebrews, you know, or the book of Hebrews that were, they just sang, they, they, they jumped off the page. And now it's like, oh my, we, we, <laughs> we, we've exegeted this, but maybe we've killed the patient, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I, I look forward to seeing Bible studies where people can actually enjoy the texts that might not be permitted in the liturgy. Uh, but that means, you know, our life has more than one. We have more than one string to our bow as uh, followers of Jesus. You know, we we don't entirely have to have everything be the same as what it is in, in worship, even though that's important. 
So this leads to another question. Uh, this is for Paul. Uh, Paul, I am amazed. Uh, you've got a little admiration society here, Paul. I'm amazed at how you're able to find those connections between a single Bible verse and a collect or other ritual text. What was your process for finding those connections? I cheated. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I shouldn't say that. I... Uh, but again, the work I do with ISIL gives us quite a bit of background on the different uh, books. So, for example, the Missal translations, uh, the, the collex came, came to under review with footnoted references to the biblical passages that were behind them. Other scholars, not, not I, other scholars did quite a bit of work on that. I am the reaper of the, the the seeds that that they sowed and i've put those together in a way that that i think others have not done but i did not personally look up them all but there are times when i do there are times i can look at a passage and i just i just know it comes from from the bible i know it, it it's alluding to something so then like anybody else i i use an internet search tap it in look it up in a couple of different languages and if there's a strong match i'll I'll take it. So uh, that you're seeing the fruit of a lot of different people working on it. You stand on the, the shoulders of, of uh, giants, or at least lots of medium-sized people who have done a great deal of work. It's great. Yeah. Uh, okay, so another question. Can you explain, this is for either of you, can you explain the pink block notes? Are they unique to this edition? Or in are they in the new American Bible Revised Edition? The pink block notes. Those are unique to this Bible. Uh, both the pink um, introductions and the pink block notes within the text. Yes, okay. that that is that is only found in this edition. Okay. Yeah. Great. And jo John and I are the ones who composed those. So yeah. I did the Old Testament. John did the New both for the introductions and for those comment notes. Yeah. And we read each other's notes and we went over them and we, right. th that, that was, that was good work, but that was a lot of careful work. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, how can this study Bible be beneficial for our non-Catholic friends? Mm. Well, Do the, we uh, to say? yeah, our, our lectionary, is similar, not identical to the lectionary in use in many other Christian denominations. Uh, of course, there are other denominations that don't use a, a lectionary at all, but everybody uses the Bible. So even if you're not uh, going into it through a, a lectionary lens, uh, whatever passage of the Bible you're, you're looking for, you'll find helpful connections there about worship. As John pointed out, many of the essays are written by non-Catholic contributors, and their work will appeal to believers of, of all kinds. Yeah. And I can say that each of my siblings has a copy of this Bible and other relatives because I gave them a copy, um, and none of them are Catholic. Uh, and so I know that they have been reading it. I know that they have been enjoying it. And it, it, it's a reason that Paul says is that uh, this is the Bible. And this is scripture, and that's something that really is, we shouldn't underrate as an ecumenical connection, right? That we, we share this heritage, even if there are some differences in that. And I think that, uh, you know, there might be questions about a particular Catholic reading of a text, let's say, or something like that, or things that are not clear. Like, it's true, as Paul says, most of the mainline Protestant churches, um, you know, have it you know, share a very common lectionary with us. But uh, even those who don't, I think, can see how the Bible is being utilized, um, you know, in their own worship. And I, I, I think that that's important. And of course, it's so significant within uh, Protestant churches and evangelical churches, the use of the Bible. Um, and, and I think that th this will speak to people in a number of ways. And I, I I would say too, and Paul, I'd, I'd be interested in, in your feedback on this. There are particular elements of our intros that reflect Catholic liturgical documents. But apart from that, I think they would speak to just about any, you know, Christian reader of the Bible. Yeah, I'd say that's true. 
because again, our driving questions are, how does worship appear here and how do we use it in worship? So yes, we have a Catholic perspective on how we use it in worship and others would have a different one, but we all rather enjoy hearing from people of other denominations how they use the Bible in their worship that always triggers something of interest for, for us as well. But I think the, that fund, the other fundamental question, how does worship appear here, is going to be instructive for everyone, and the essays will we'll unpack them in, in greater detail. Um, th th uh, two more questions, and I think we, we may be wrapping it up then. Uh, given your experiences, do, do you, I think, beyond this uh, project, do you believe that Catholic biblical familiarity, literacy, and application is improving, mm. the same, or declining, and if so, mm. why or why not? Well, I, I'd say literacy is improving just because of the number of scripture readings people are hearing at uh, at worship these days. And even as, as I pointed out, even if they're they're not at worship daily, people are at home praying over biblical passages as never before. What uh, what this Bible will do, of course, is to broaden it beyond lectionary into the entire Bible and and give people other ways to encounter it. I don't know what you think, John, but I, th I think Catholic biblical literacy is on the rise. Yeah, I, I think that that might be the case. I'd, it, it's interesting because um, I taught for 20 years in Minnesota and I taught at a Catholic university, but we had almost 50 percent Lutheran students because it's Minnesota. Uh, so, you know, it was interesting. You could see with younger people, uh, I think across the board in some ways, less knowledge of the Bible. The law. So I taught there from 2001 to 2021, and I thought there was less literacy amongst young people, uh, interestingly, and I thought that had to do with whether or not people were reading regularly. On the other hand, I agree with Paul. I think the access to the Bible that one has now and the quick access that you can find excellent um, excellent translations online, right? You can find the NABRE online, the NRSV online. And I do think that access now allows people to engage with the Bible um, pretty quickly and rapidly. And I think that one of the things I'd want to stress too, and this is where I agree with Paul, is I think Catholics know more of the Bible than they realize. And I think the study Bible <laughs> makes that clear that the Bible infuses the liturgy. It's everywhere. And I think the more they read the Bible, the more they're going to say, see that. Because when I started to attend Catholic Mass with my Catholic friends as a, you know, as a student, I realized, oh, there's a lot of Bible here. You know, like I was coming to it from the point of view, not of what's taking place in the liturgy, but what am I experiencing here? And what I was experiencing was a lot of the biblical texts. Uh, so, um, what was your biggest unexpected learning while working on this project is another question that came from our audience. Yeah, I, I think for me, it's one John already alluded to, and uh, that is how the worship of Christ precedes the Gospels, that there is there's a whole layer of belief and worship going on before we have the Bible. And this, uh, I'm sure for a scripture scholar like John, this is kind of a, a dictum that just goes without saying uh, some, something you start from. But I think it's good for all of us to recall how the the first encounter with Christ is is an encounter with Him with, in in faith, and then from that these we have these these fruits, primary among them the the Scripture. But it is Christ seeking us and inviting us to His Word through this written Word, and that that happened because of people who knew Him and heard about him and were worship him, worshiping him even before they were able to hand down to us a means to make that happen. Yeah, I, I certainly agree with that wholeheartedly. I, I would also say what, what emerged for me, and, and Paul's right, as a scripture scholar, this is something I've spent, you know, so much of my life examining and knowing, but something that did emerge for me in doing this work was the fact that like Paul's letters, which I study and which I've written on, 
really were documents sent by a real person and and friends of his to other real people, and that they were initially, I would argue, liturgical documents, that they were to be read in church and heard, that they were a communication among Christians. And I think I knew that, of course, but it, it came alive in doing this work because of who we're writing for, right? For me, I can write an article and maybe it's read through in my lifetime by 50 people, right? But, but I, I, you know, maybe that's not that much of an exaggeration, right? It's like written technically and for a particular group. But a study Bible like this brings to mind who you're really writing for. And that's like the whole community. And that's who Paul was writing for. Mm. You know, and, and uh, the two of you have just addressed uh, one of the final questions which mm. came up in the chat, which I thought was a very good one, which was, could you elaborate more on the connection to life? And I think you've really opened up that, that topic and uh, it would that we had more time to uh, explore it, but I think you're, you're pointing to those connections that come alive when you're looking for them mm -hmm. uh, and something that can be overlooked if we're not sensitive to the living quality of the revelation and of the people who pass that revelation on in the early Christian church, in the in the texts of scripture, in the encounter with Jesus that that still takes place today in mystery, in the, the encounter in the liturgy. Um, so I, I just want to um, ask you if you have any closing thoughts, either of you uh, speak Speak now. <laughs> okay. Well, I I really appreciated working with Paul, who 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 brings an incredible amount of knowledge about the liturgy, which I certainly don't have, and who undersells his knowledge of the Bible, um, <laughs> with with great humility, because you know I I think this was a working partnership. Much of it took place during COVID, which made it clear how significant it is to gather together as well when we were all separated. And it, I think we would have been able to get together more often in person uh, had COVID not occurred, but we did our work from a distance um, and it was easy to do because Paul is easy to work with and as is liturgical press uh, who, who supported us throughout the whole of it. But I just think that it's a great resource um, and I'm, I'm thankful for being able to participate in it. Paul, any closing thoughts? Well, uh, I owe John thanks as well. He he brings his own expertise, but he was also networked with many different writers who contributed those introductory essays, and uh, he knew of resources I, I would I would not have known to to track down, and uh, those contributions are just really uh, exceptionally fine. So again, thanks to Lit Press for inviting us to be part of the the project and for their idea to to bring this to light. It's been a, a great honor to to do it and to present this work for the broader use of, of the Christian community. And I have one final thought to add, and that is I see this effort as part of the continuing reception of the Second Vatican Council, which mandated that Catholics should receive, quote, richer fare at the table of God's word. Uh, from the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy. Such warm and affirming language uh, the Council used to underline again and again that God is speaking to us still, who's speaking to his people. And Christ, uh, again, quoting from the Constitution, is still proclaiming his gospel, even today. Uh, Dei Verbum, the Constitution on Divine Revelation, affirmed, uh, this is paragraph uh, 21, quote, the force and power of the word of God is so great that it stands as the support and energy of the church, the strength of faith for her sons and daughters, the food for the soul, the pure and everlasting source of spiritual life. Are we there yet? in appreciating the great gift that is God's word in the liturgy and in our life? I don't think so. That work is ongoing, but it's my hope, and I think it is, as I think it is yours, that this tool might help us to undertake that work more generously. 
Thank you all for coming. And a special thank you to our esteemed speakers who have given us so much here, just in this hour, but also in the years that they toiled over this, this beautiful and wonderful book. And thank you to all the folks at Liturgical Press who worked hard to make this webinar possible. The webinar recording link will be emailed to everyone who registered, and it will be posted on YouTube uh, soon. So if you know of others who might be interested in seeing this recording, please do pass the word along. And check your email from Liturgical Press for a special offer on the Liturgy and Life Study Bible that is coming to you soon. There's nothing like a sale. So uh, thank you once again. Thank you one and all. God bless.